I'll come straight to the point. Uh, this is, uh, don't get overwhelmed by a subject like Indian civilization and all that. It's all a fancy way of putting things. This is something that you see all around you, and today I'll try to help you ask the right questions. Ask questions more and more as we go along. You see, have you ever wondered how we treat India when Mrs. Venkat Raman sitting next to an Ahuja, sitting next to a call, and then you have somebody from Northeast, and none of us feel odd about it. Have you noticed? We don't feel odd about it because there's something unifying among all of us. See the craziness with which we watch matches, wave, shout. There's no seeding of difference, but if you look at it intensely, you'll find the difference between two groups in India is more than that is 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 more than the difference between let us say a Scotsman and a Polish. At least a Scotsman and a Polish have something in common. But what would let us say somebody who has never travelled beyond uh, Kerala would have common between somebody in Arunachal? But that really has not precluded us from becoming one nation, as uh, Mukul read out. The British have always insisted on two things, that India is just a geographical expression. It's never a nation. It never was a nation. There's a quote by Strachey, one of the imperial scholars, who said, there is not and never was an Indian nation. Pronouncement. They cursed us before leaving. And the second thing that they insisted was that we got you guys together. We got you guys together. Had it not been for us, you would have been remaining quarreling ethnicities. Well, they have a pinch of truth, but loads of lies. I'll, I'll explain to you as we move along. First of all, we must, once we accept the fact that we are here together and we don't feel odd about it, widely different languages, we, we have our own systems of reaching our equilibrium. We can talk in a common language and go back and have our food. Talk to our aunts or grandmothers in our language and talk to others in the language they'll understand and keep switching gears as we talk. And that is... Now, first of all, the first misinformation that we need to dispose of is that this was acquired by conquest. Unities are usually a byproduct of conquest, no doubt about it. But in the case of India, the country as we know, or the country that we knew at 19, 1947, was never, I insist, never held together in its whole. Not even during the British period. They had 14 pink provinces, British provinces, and 565. 565 kingdoms. Many of you know of Jodhpur, Jaipur, Bhopal, Vagare, Vagare. You know all of these. So these were different kingdoms. You needed a passport, you needed a visa, you needed a separate currencies there. Okay, they are within what we call the subcontinent of India, but they were technically all separate. They had their own suffice, they had their own canons, they had their own everything. So 565 princely states or kingdoms and 14 different provinces was what the British gifted us and said Tata goodbye, leaving us at that point. But before that, the first essential lessons we are taught in history is that India has been united by great emperors like Chandragupta Maurya, the Mauryas, the Guptas, the Mughals. These are the three major dynasties just to get you off the wrong impression, the Mauryas never ruled more than two-thirds of India. And it's a very loose form of rule. At the highest also, Karnataka, uh, Andhra, Tamil Nadu, it's all outside their land. Huh. But they went all the way up to Afghanistan and beyond. That's on a different issue. Move on, a few hundred years later, the Guptas, the Imperial Guptas. Yeah, the Imperial Guptas never even crossed the Narbada. When they talk of the art of Imperial Guptas, look at the art of Ajanta, Ajanta was outside the realm. 
It's like us claiming Bangladesh is ours. I mean, it's sort of, you're not there in the border. Ah, but they had a profound influence. I'm not demeaning them. I'm just telling you that territorially they were not in command of even more than 55% of India. That's all. They had a glorious period. 55% is all they controlled. Move on to the, uh, to the Mughals. Forget the first two. Come to number three, four, and five, and six. Six is a bit of a problem. But at six was the highest. And that was around 75% of troubled India. Theoretically, they held India together. Aurangzeb held India theoretically about 75%. The point is, it was never, 100% of it was never got together. So the Nairs and the Pillais were always out. But they are very much a part of an integral civilization. So was there another level beyond conquest that got us together? Obviously, the answer lies that it was not in conquest. There was various aggregators playing along. It's time we recognized Indian history for its real worth, not for what the textbooks tell us. What were these aggregators? I would personally give credit to two groups. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not referring to castes. I'm referring to socioeconomic groups. One group was the, what I would say, would call the, uh, the bearers of Brahmanical culture, largely Brahmins. Uh, whether we like them or don't dislike them, whether we feel they, were imposed, they had imposed wrong systems is beyond the point. Factually, they were carrying together a particular message and narrative that ultimately got India together. I'll come to the point how it all happened. And the second was very interesting. You have a map of India, yeah? This is very interesting. Ah, I was wondering what this stick is for. It was placed next to Mukul, and I thought <laughs> that this was something that the lady study group does on. I, I wasn't really sure, but anyway. So, <laughs> I didn't know, sir. So looked very threatening. Now I remember. It's a pointer. Nandita, take note. Uh, now, the second group. We're traders, entrepreneurs, and that's one role we don't give them their dues. Let me explain how they operated. I'll just give you one or two examples, and you'll see how this group had crisscrossed India, because there were only two groups that crisscrossed India, and everybody else was in their little puddles. They were in their little village, province, kingdom, whatever you had, and most of them had never crossed the boundaries of their village. And yet, they were all subject to a pan-Indian narrative that was brought in, preached, propagated, call it whatever. I'll give you an example how these things, how, how when bullock carts were the only means of communication, see the enterprise of the Indian trading groups. A ship would come in from, does it work? would come in from, say, China and come up somewhere in Rup Narayan. Rup eh, Ganga was then silted, so it comes along Rup Narayan. Rup Narayan is, I don't know whether you know, near Haldia. Anyway, it comes along and meets the Bhagirathi, and then it goes up, up the Bhagirathi to a point. There was no Farakka barrage, so you could sail through, and goes along the Ganga around this way, and finally, the Ganga has three left-hand turns, three major left-hand turns. It takes a third left-hand turn, a river called Chambal. Chambal. Chambal Daku, remember? Pulan Devi, that Chambal. And then it turns around from Chambal this way, and it comes along, and then the Chambal becomes unnavigable. So our merchants know exactly what to do. They transfer their goods to a tributary of the Chambal called Shipra, a holy river. Now you'll understand why it's holy. So Shipra, and from Shipra, at the end of Shipra, you get a town called Ujjain. Now you'll understand how commerce and piety were all mixed up together. Because these were important trading ports, there was Chanda given. 
Lots of chanda given, lots of wealth flowing. So Ujjain becomes a very important trading center come a pilgrimage. And all you did was offload it at Ujjain and next morning go by bullock carts to reach the Narbada at a point called Mahesh. Mahesh Sari is I think, na? Maheshwar. Maheshwar. So Maheshwar or Mahesh as it's called, you reach there in exactly two days. And once you are Mahesh, you are on Narbada. And on Narbada, you come out into the Bay of, into the Arabian Sea, and tata goodbye. So you have served. Have I been able to explain one route more or less? So there were hundreds of routes like this, and to explain how these things happened, and why I picked on two groups, you have to understand that when you think of Chanakya, Chanakya was supposedly born. We haven't figured out. He didn't carry his Aadhaar certificate. Now, uh, we didn't have them at that time. So, Chanakya was born somewhere near Kanchipuram, deep down in south, and went up this way, holding on to river valleys one after the other, one after the other, till he reached Peshawar. studied and when he taught to him. And from there he goes down in search of work to Patliputra, Patna. Can you see the crisscrossing of India? Crisscrossing at a time when there were hardly any means of transport. It was that compulsion that got India together. I, you know Shankaracharya? You know where he's born? So most of you know, but uh, just for the heck of it, I'll explain. He's born here, goes and sets up a mutt here in the Himalayas. The second mutt he sets up at Dwarka. The third mutt he sets up at Jagannath. And the fourth mutt at Rameswaram here. So you have one, two, three, four, the diamond of India being crisscrossed by a diamond-like structure at four corners. India was never ruled from the center. That essence of Indian wisdom, never. One nutcase tried it. His name was Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Think, I got to rule from the center. Phew. Would not like to think much about it. Now, these are the same places that the British chose in all their advanced wisdom for four capitals also. Calcutta, Bombay, Delhi, and Madras. Thing. I mean, there's no connection between the two, but that's how you operate. Okay, so move on. The, this, these two classes that I mentioned were the trading groups and this thing. They have actually contributed a lot uh, to getting India together. They were what I call the aggregators. Huh. The ruling groups were, of course, there, the Kshatriyas, the Rajputs, whatever you call them, but they were highly localized. It's only after the trains came in that they sort of got crisscrossed each other and got intermarried with different places. Now, to understand this story of India, we must understand space or geography, and we must understand time. To space, the spatial part is, as I said, the holy rivers. First of all, all major rivers are converted into holy. And they are holy because, I mean, don't mess around with it, huh? because they are our national highways. They were the national highways. So every river, Nashik, it's what the hell has Nashik to do? It's not in the Ganga. Hang on, hang on. Nashik is very close to the Arabian Sea near Barut. You could bring things to Nashik in one day from the Arabian Sea. And Nashik is on a river which connects to Bhima. Okay? Bhima is a tributary of Godavari. And Godavari means you can come out here. This is Nashik. There's a river going. This is the Godavari. And you come out here to Machlipatnam. 
So everything, once you start looking at it, everything has got something to do with some source of economic wealth. And this economic transfers of power, transfers of goods and services actually got my country together. And the philosophy that held it together, I'm not coming into the good part or the bad, bad part of it. That we'll discuss some other day. This is what I'm saying is just a sarangsh, just the little bit, the, the what actually happened. So, first of all, you have the reverse all being taken into account. And lest you forget, every prayer begins with Ganga, Saraswati, Yamuna, Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, Sindhu, Kaveri, Krishna, isn't it? So, this is to get the idea clear to everyone in every place. Somebody who has not seen any of these rivers, somebody in Tripura, who has not seen any of the rivers, knows these rivers by heart from day one. So, that's the operational style of how you take it. Similar mountains. I get amazed at a time when people walk by foot. How on earth did you discover Kailash? And Kailash is not, not only a source of beauty and inspiration, it's a place from where you get three important rivers coming out. The three important rivers... Oh, I, thought, I thought somebody was raising slogans. Now, band karo. So, uh, Kailash is a place from where you get three important rivers coming out. The Indus, the Ganga system, and the Brahmaputra systems. So, this extent of geography comes from people who are adventurous and enterprising. So, you have all the mountains, the Vindhyas, as sacred. So, we have declared all the highways to be sacred. You have declared all the impediments to be sacred. All the mountains and barriers to be sacred. And as you move along, the most enterprising, most interesting way of getting all of India together were the two epics. I'm not getting into the details of the epics, good, bad, whether somebody was born here or somebody was not, that's not my business. That's for others, genealogists to find out, people. What I am interested is the mechanism in which it operated. Both the epic, epics had two convenient periods when you are off the map, no more GPS functioning. Okay, 14 years, one was. And 13 years, one was, and one year of Agyat was. Chauda Chauda mil gaya. For 14 years, the protagonists of both the epics, protagonist groups, were moving around all sorts of places with all sorts of names. And every part of India claimed that I am Chitrakoot. I am Manipur. There are 1,719 claimants for Manipur. So you understand, by spreading the names and spreading the identities and then claiming the names and claiming the identities. You've all gone on visits. How many times have we been shown which cave Hanuman was born in? Huh? Wherever you go, they say, Sita Maya stayed here. The idea is not whether she was on a uh, wind sharing basis or whatever. The idea was the idea was to identify the main character of an epic, a holy person, a holy character with a place and then bring the place from the outlier to the center. What a stratagem. So all these places that are mentioned there, I have seen at least nine places where they say, Jata, you fell. Finally asked them at the seventh place, did anyone see him falling? So, Jatai, you fell here in Andhra Pradesh, Lepakshi and all that, all sorts of places. The idea is not to ridicule. It's very easy to ridicule. The idea is to understand the mechanics of the mind, that you identify so many places. So you move on, on these places, and then you identify the lots of, of this process. You get a certain amount of net results of certain points being declared. Uh, un inarguably holy. The four Kums, Haridwar, Prayag, Nashik, Ujjain. Have you noticed Ujjain, Nashik? So they, all of them come into the holy network. 
All of them come into what we call the sacred, sacred network, and then you have Rameshwara, Mathura, Vrindavan, and all that. So this acceptance by a guy sitting in, as I said, Tripura, or somebody who stays in Bankura, who's not even seen the Ganga property, would be identified, and he would feel himself to be a part of this whole narrative. That's all. Now you move on to timing. I said special. That's geographical, then you move on to the temporal, timing. Timing is an obsession with Indians. What do we call it? I mean, we're all late. Mohurat, Kal, Shubh Mohurat. It has to be done by 13th, by 30, by, by 7, 7 a.m., 7.10, 7 hours, 10 minutes, otherwise Shubh Kal will go away. So, this question of timing and determining the panchang, the calendar, the date, this thing, obsession, was an all India phenomenon. Even before these guys were called Hindus or Buddhists or whatever, this remained a one of the unifiers of India. And the very clever adjustment between the solar and the lunar. See, the lunar is very easy to understand. If you start from today, and look at today's moon. We just three, two days away from um, Purnima. So we are on the Krishna Paksh now. Don. So you'll see it's around 90%, 80%, 70%. If you observe the moon for two months, you'll get the hang of it what date it is. You'll get the hang of it. It's so easy because I have seen it. So everything is determined according to the moon. But the moon has only 28 days, na? Problem. Sun has 365 days, like this marriage reconciliation. I mean, you can't do away with it also. So you have to have, so you bring in solar year, lunar years, you bring in some festivals are according to Tithi, that is lunar calendar. Some are fixed according to the solar calendar. You manage to blunder along, that's all. This is what held, holds together. So the first one about is on timing. The second one is about timing. I'll say it a little later. This is about timing of festivals and how they come up. But before that, we need to come to the deities, the gods and goddesses. This is a fascinating process. And the fascinating process is to understand it. Uh, so the first is uh, the process that began from roughly the Vedas till roughly the Guptas. That's around a period of almost 2,500 years. This was a period when every deity was accepted. There's no question of rejection. Ye pagan hai, ye heathen hai, Why? ye vidaishi hai. Talk Hindustani. Nothing is this thing. If a community, a group, an ethnic group, a tribal group, a community worships X, you accept it. He looks like a booth. That's your problem. Whatever. So everything under the sun, with whatever is accepted by any community of consequence, is brought in. Now, you declare it to be Deva Devi. Isn't it? Every stone Little You don't even know what it is. Every stone, every piece of wood, every tree. Have you noticed that all the trees come around? Uh, they are the center of all temples. From today, you start observing and you'll see all street shrines are around trees, at the foot of trees, at this. So this basic belief in mountains, in rivers, in trees, and all that leads to a widespread acceptance of every form of worship. Every form, including the ones who crack skulls or chop heads. Ghastly now, but it happened. But that is the Indian process. Bring it in slowly. And over a period, all of them were deified. The deification held all the people together. Conflicting groups. This one gore. You don't worry about Kale Gore and all that. You worship, you worship, you keep your things together. First, this process, and then you find the process of the 
mega deities forming. Who are the mega deities? According to the Vedic period, the mega, mega deities are Indra, Varun, Agni, Vagara Vagara. Hey, no? You know that Rudra, that period. You've heard of it. You've never seen them. You said. By the 11th century, by the 7th century, this had started changing. And gradually, 7th century is very interesting because it marks the real arrival of the Devi. Now, patriarchal religion always has problem with women. Always has this problem. So you keep them on the sidelines. You say, ha, ah, Devi hai, Devi hai, but, but you don't care much. So when I say this, I talk of legitimacy. And legitimacy was in the form of 18 Mahapuranas. These 18 Mahapurana, Padma Puran, Skanda Puran, Vayu Puran, Agni Puran, Shiv Puran, you've heard of them. You may not have read them. I don't think anybody takes the trouble. And chalo. So these Purans give you the sacred literature, the normative structure. One after a lady. Mata Puran. Ille. No. So the first Puran through which we get the legitimacy of female power is Markandeya Puran. Markandeya Puran has a whole section called Devi Mahatva. The Devi Mahatma brings in, and once this brings in, Ya Devi Sarva Bhutish, once she comes in via one, let us say, surrogate method or whatever, indirect method, she's there. And the first impact of it is that immediately the triad of the Vedic period is replaced. The triad of the Vedic period, remember? First was Rudra, he is converted into Shiva. Second was Brahma, Brahma is sent out on pension to Pushkar, on a hill station to Pushkar. That's the only place. Indra is basically given Shutti, but we don't have a temple of Indra. But you remember Indra. Hindustan ma kabi bhulte nahi kisi ko. You remember Indra as the suffix of a name. Like Dharmendra, Narendra, I am not political here. So, huh, just a suffix of a name. But he's there, eh? he's not there, he's there, he's not there. So, we have this way of pensioning off the Vedic gods, and who replaces them? Brahma, uh, sorry, Brahma, sorry, I forgot, he's on pension. Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi. The appearance of Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi over a period of 300 years leads to a very fascinating process. It leads to a lot of mergers and acquisitions. There's lots of mergers and acquisitions. So over a period you find the first major merger and acquisition is Vishnu. Once you get Dash Avatar, in one stroke you have got nine deities into one. The tenth is yet to come. Hai na? So you have nine of them rolled into one. Then you have different rupas of Shiva. Devi, my God, completely foxed. Kali is Devi, Gauri is also Devi. Never mind the fair and lovely. So we keep it there. We find all the contradictions and everything. Don't take it seriously because we are now studying some, you are now looking at a subject that's your own. And we are talking within our own. So we get the appearance of the true Indic religion. And what is that? In one phrase, it is a management of contradictions. India's success has always lied in not in homogenization or one niti, one this thing, one that. It lies in the management of contradictions. You have all managed contradictions, and more than that, you have managed the world. Because the other half, you inform, all of you inform on a need to know basis. Hai na? Baki to, the other half ko aap sab kuch batate, kabhi nahi. On a need to know basis. 
At least that's what I get the feeling in my house. Yeah, tum to flying visitor ho, you will be told on a need to know basis. So on a need to know basis is on this basis of what I said, the arrival of three mega deities means that all the deities we talked about are now squeezed into them. They are acquired or they are absorbed into them. Example, very good. Look at the Bhavan Peet Sthans of Shakti, scattered all over, isn't it? So wherever there was a prominent sector, huh? 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 wherever there was a prominent place of worship of the Devi, she is brought in as this, as Maheshwari, as this, Shari, as Kankaleshwari, as this, that's it. Wherever the Jyotir lingers, right from north to south, along with the second, second layer of the Shiva worship, then you have the 108 plus Vishnu worships. These aggregations take place and finally I will end up by saying that the real spirit of India lies in its festivals, the management of contradictions that I said. I'll, any one or two examples like, say, Navaratri. Navaratri is a very rigorous festival in North India that's centered. Look at what happens in East. Look at what happens in South. In South, they have never even heard of Navaratri being connected to either Rama or Durga. They have their own ways of dealing with Navaratri, but it's Navaratri. Whether you keep a fast or you gorge and meat and fish is your business, but you have to have your own, own this thing. Navaratri is also connected with fertility. Like in Maharashtra, they have this Ghat Sthapana. In Gujarat, they have Garba. What is Garba? Womb. It's, it symbolizes the pot. It's a fertility festival, first and foremost. And Garba ke saath, you have put Dandiya. That's all. So this is how we operate, one, one against the other. Look at Diwali and look at Diwali and you start with five of these dates for Diwali, Dhanteras and you start, of course Dhanteras is an infection that's spreading all over India now. <laughs> huh. Everybody wants to buy something on Dhanteras day, it's, it goes, but that is India, nothing is stagnant. And then you say that Diwali, it's a festival of lights and Lakshmi. Look at these bongs. They worship darkness and the dark. No, no, it's not as far as contradiction that you think it is. Because within this, you have this day that we have as Bhut Chaturdeshi. Bhut Chaturdeshi is there in all of them, more or less. What you call as Choti Diwali. It's how you call it, it's called Narak Chaturdeshi, Najar Chaturdeshi, it's called by different names. So that's the whole idea. One who celebrated Narak Chaturdeshi, and Narak Chaturdeshi is incidentally is not celebration of Narak. It's a celebration of the victory of a woman called Satyabhama who defeated Narak Asur. Because Krishna got fagged out. That's all. That's the story. So we have all these things coming in in between, woven into one. Look at Makar Sankranti. It's known by 40 different names. Bohagi Bhilu, Bihu, it's known as Vishu, it's known as by different things. Uh, the Gujaratis fly kites. The monks wouldn't dare to fly kites because you thanda lege jabe. So all sorts of things. So we have this thing, I read, middle of January. They have monkey caps and all sorts of things. Huh? But then, uh, since good wasn't grown in Bengal, you have Tilen Nadu. You come up with your solution, the innovativeness you got. But the, what is the essence of Makar Sankranti? All women would know, I take two moments. All women would know that you can't run a household without five things. The four essential things are salt, masala, oil, because you don't use animal fat in India, oil, sugar. And the fifth one is a maid, if possible. Okay. So these four are essential. And in India, you had sugar. Uh, in India, you had salt was plenty. Spices were plenty. Problem is, sugar and oil came through crops. Do you know what is the origin of tela? Til. It comes from a word called tila. Til. And the oleoresin of til is called taila. 
tailam tela so the original purest oil is gingelly oil or til til oil so everything that we call as oil is actually we are referring to still now till and sugar cane came up together in the month of november and that is a reminder in our festival what do we celebrate makar sankranti we gajak revdi what is gajak revdi til and gud so you have to understand the festivals for their own values it's easy to laugh away it's easy to denigrate it's easy to even give uh, superior values but the actual thing was these two crops came in and if you had sugar a bountiful sugar and a bountiful tail crop you were assured of 2 and 2 4 you were assured of the sugar supply and you were assured of the oil supply and the maize supply remains like this always even from then from those days so you had at every level you will find that this sort of a thing is the essence so even if you look at three festivals i've just named three i have lots of them navratri diwali you look at makar sankranti you will find the essence of it is management of contradictions and adornment of history we don't understand why is it that in winter gajak and rodi as are given they are celebration yaar now you can get cube sugar in any form anywhere but they are celebration the historic celebration the historic memory of the story of how india got together so i'll close at this level i let you think and give me more and more inputs as you go along if you observe something that i have missed out please send it to me via whatever route the story of india is one of complete coordination amalgamation and a voluntary union of maddening impossible ethnic differences 600 languages god knows how many ethnic groups something like 1400 ethnic groups they held together by a narrative by a value system and by certain enterprising communities that have brought them together through the journey of history in the management of contradictions thank you very much